This video is part of an audiobook series featuring robots by the MIT Press Essential Knowledge Series by John Jordan in 2016. For more audiobooks, please visit my YouTube channel, find me on Spotify, or check out my website for downloads. Chapter 2. The Prehistory of an Idea Humans have attempted to recreate life for millennia, and many robots in the early 21st century continue these traditions. The context for today's efforts is important to acknowledge, especially given the both problematic and enduring character of some of these discussions. The impact of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is difficult to overstate, to take only one example. Words. Before we look at history, a bit about terminology. For such a familiar concept, it turns out that robots are extremely difficult to define. According to the American Heritage Dictionary of the English Language, 3rd edition, a robot is, quote, a mechanical device that sometimes re resembles a human being and is capable of performing a variety of often complex human tasks on command or by being programmed in advance, end quote. This biomimicry raises one set of issues, especially in regard to autonomous robots. The Oxford English Dictionary definition presents a second literary area of complexity. Quote, chiefly science fiction, an, intelligence, an intelligent artificial being typically made of metal and resembling in some way a human or other animal. End quote. Roboticists themselves struggle to pin down the definition of their field. George Beakey, an expert in autonomous robots, defined a robot by its characteristics, sensing, artificial cognition, and physical action. Quote, never ask a roboticist wo what a robot is, end quote, from Ilya Reza Nurbakish of Carnegie Mellon and another expert in autonomous robots. Quote, continued, the answer changes too quickly. By the time researchers finish their most recent debate on what is and isn't a robot, the frontier moves on as whole new interaction technologies are born. End quote. Rodney Brooks, when he was at MIT, called robots artificial creatures. According to a college textbook chosen at random, quote, the Robotic Institute of America defines a robot as a reprogrammable, multifunctional manipulator designed to move materials, parts, tools, or specialized devices through variable programmed motions for the performance of a variety of tasks. This definition does not exclude human beings, end quote. Cynthia Briaziel at MIT gained fame for her work on Kismet, a special variety of humanoid robot that interacted with people using gestures, facial expressions, and sounds. What is a social robot, she asks in her book on the topic, saying it is a difficult concept to define. After pointing to, scientific or to science fiction for some examples, she asserts, quote, In short, a sociable robot is socially intelligent in a human-like way, and interacting with it is like interacting with another person. At the pinnacle of achievement, they could befriend us, as we could them, end quote. Once again, a leading roboticist resorts to describing robots by what they do rather than by what they are. Two relatively recent definitions illustrate the lack of consensus, a real problem when it comes to fostering intelligent debate over a topic with far-reaching implications for personal and public life. Maja Matarik of the University of Southern California published The Robotics Primer in 2007 as a K-12 through guide to this important field. Almost immediately in the opening chapter, she states that, quote, a robot is an autonomous system which exists in the physical world, can sense its environment, and can act on it to achieve some goals. She goes on to underline conviction, saying, true robots may be able to take input and advice from humans, but are not completely controlled by them, end quote. Contrast this strict definition, which excludes many familiar machines such as surgical robots, drone aircraft, and industrial robots, with the definition used on a 60 Minutes broadcast in 2013 that focused on technological unemployment. Narr narrator Steve Croft began the segment by saying that, quote, Everyone has a different idea of what a robot is and what they look like, but the broad universal definition is a machine that can perform the job of a human. They can be mobile or stationary, hardware or software, and they're marching out of the realm of science fiction and into the mainstream, 
end quote. Apart from the nearly complete lack of overlap with roboticists' definitions, this characterization is notable for its implied theme of machines out of control, rising up against their human masters. From the core of computer science comes a similarly inclusive reading. Vinton Turf, widely known for his work on the Transmission Control Protocol, TCP, and Internet Protocol, IP, which underlie all internet traffic, was elected president of the Association of Computing Machinery in 2012. In an editorial in January 2013, Cerf post posited, quote, that the notion of robot could usefully be expanded to include programs that perform functions, ingest input, and produce output that has a perceptible effect, end quote. After mentioning high-frequency stock trading as an example, he argued that, quote, one might conclude that we should treat as robots any programs that have real-world, if not physical, effect, end quote. In his conclusion, Turf reveals a broader concern for the implications of contemporary computing and communications, including robots, robotics strictly defined. Quote, I believe it would be a contribution to our society to encourage deeper thinking about what we in the computing world produce, the tools we use to produce them, the resilience and reliability that these products exhibit, and the risks that they may introduce. End quote. This thinking helps move the discussion of robotics away from anthropomorphism and toward instrumentality. For Churf, a robot is largely a function of software rather than the box it inhabits. But that software increasingly does have implications for the world of atoms, whether in the form of denial of service attacks, cyber warfare on physical infrastructure, such as Stuxnet, a computer virus that disabled centri centrifuges enriching atomic weapons material in Iran, or inside a mobile and potentially autonomous robot. For our purposes, the most useful definition comes from George Bakey, who wrote in 2005 that, quote, a robot is a machine that senses, thinks, and acts. Thus, a robot must have sensors, processing ability that emulates some aspects of cognition, and actuators, end quote. Robotics is the collected sciences that combine to study, design, and build these devices. Computer science is in the forefront, drawing also on material sciences, psychology, statistics, mathematics, and various disciplines in physics and engineering. Artificial intelligence concerns itself with the recreation of human cognition in silicon semiconductors, either generally or in a delimited domain to be constrained and optimized. Historical automata. For all of this definitional uncertainty, billions of people around the world know a robot when they see one, based on literary and Hollywood portrayals, so it is important to note the precise origins of the term. People have been creating automated models of living systems for millennia. Cuckoo clocks, toys, and elaborate automaton hoaxes date back hundreds of years. One of these dates from 1770 and involved a chess-playing automaton with a chess master hiding inside that defeated both Benjamin Franklin and Napoleon I. It provided the name for Amazon's Mechanical Turk, a service in which computers ask people for help in doing tasks that computers aren't good at, such as image recognition. A more colorful invention came from France, a country that continues to help define the robotics horizon. As a child of the Enlightenment, Jacques de Vaucanson attempted to apply the notions of the clockwork universe to biological life. In 1735, at the age of 26, he invented some machines that could excite public curiosity, specifically a mechanical duck. Vaucanson's duck combined a realistic exterior with some unsurprising mechanical characteristics. It could sit, stand, waddle, quack, drink water, and eat pellets of corn. A secondary trick made Vokensen a celebrity and gained him Alexis election to the prestigious Académie de Sciences, alongside René Descartes, Jean-Baptiste Colbert, and Blaise Pascal. The mechanical duck also defecated. People lined up to see the wonder, paying admissions fees equal to a week's wages for some. Vokensen then became director of France's silk mills, which in 1745, he invented a punch card system for controlling weaving patterns, a foundation invention for the jacquard loom 
developed in 1801 that proved to influence the early history of computing, where punch cards were once again used to control a sequence of operations. As for the duck, 40 years later it was found, like the chess machine, to be a hoax. The bird did no digesting, but rather captured the inputs from one reservoir and dispensed the output from another. As the noted policy analyst P.W. Singer points out, Vokensen's duck provides a vivid, vivid illustration of humanity's long-running efforts to create artificial life. In Jewish folklore, the concept of a golem, which is an anthropomorphic figure made from inanimate material, dates back to biblical times. For centuries, the word android was used to describe automatons resembling a human being, to quote the Oxford English Dictionary. The word dates from 1728, less than a decade before the infamous duck. Mary Shelley published Frankenstein, often cited as the first science fiction novel, in 1818 and described the dire consequences of trying to create life in the laboratory. In 1822, Charles Babbage built his Difference Engine, a mechanical calculator containing more than 25,000 parts. So people have been trying to create simulations of biological life for a long time. Where did robots enter the picture? Automata. Science fiction. By the time he published his play, R.U.R., or Rossum's Universal Robots, in 1920, Carol Chapik was a well-known Czech intellectual. Like other writers, he was appalled by the carnage wrought by the mechanical and chemical weapons that marked the Great War as a departure from previous combat. The play introduced the robot, an artificial human made from biological material, into the English language as a protest against the dehumanization caused by the modern age. Conformity, lack of aspiration, and a cheerful attitude toward dull work were all critiqued with the concept. The word derives from the Czech word robota, or forced labor, as done by serfs. Its Slavic linguistic root, rob, means slave. Thus, the original word for robotics more accurately defines androids in that they were neither metallic nor, me or, nor me mechanical. Several were mistaken for human beings in the play. The play was, was widely performed, and the text translated into many languages, probably because the robot was an idea whose time had come. For science fiction, at any rate, popular depictions proliferated in the following decades. Thus, the definitional, the definitional dilemma in which we find ourselves dates back about a 100 years to a time when a literary artist used a slavery metaphor to protest the devaluation of human life in a mechanical era. Through the 1920s, robot images centered on the hubris of humans creating life, connecting mechanical invention to Frankenstein and earlier legends of overreaching humanity. By 1942, however, the next wave of definition was taking the notion of a robot in a much more positive direction. Either directly through his writing or indirectly through his wide influence, Isaac Asimov, born Isaac Yudovich Ozimov in Russia in 1920, is single-handedly responsible for m most North American conceptions of what a robot can be. Early in his astonishingly prolific career as a writer, with more than 500 books to his credit, Asimov helped found the modern genre of science fiction. In later years, he published literary criticism, nonfiction science writing, mysteries, and novels. After earning the first of his three degrees in chemistry from Columbia in 1939, Asimov teamed up with John Campbell, who edited Astounding Science Fiction magazine to generate the three laws of robotics, which both served as the governing principles for his robotic science fiction and guided generations of roboticists whose field at the time lacked formal definition, ethical codes of conduct, and other marks of professional maturity. In the early years of this complex work, Science fiction was both powerfully inspirational and the only widely available resource, and Asimov stood at the forefront. He later wrote in a nonfiction introduction to the state of robotics in the 1980s, Asimov was, quote, tiring of robots that were either unrealistically wicked or unrealistically noble, and began to write science fiction tales in which robots revered, were viewed merely as machines, built as all machines are, with an attempt at adequate safeguards, end quote. 
Nine of the stories written in the 1940s in response to this impulse were collected in the book, I, Robot. In one of them, Asimov coins the term robotics and so named an entire discipline of modern science and engineering. Asimov's three laws of robotics worked well to define a functional environment, but have been less useful in actual practice. No matter how often people have tried to encode them in hardware, nearly 75 years after they were written as the premise of a fantasy. The laws are as follows. 1. A robot may not injure a human being or, through inaction, allow a human being to come into harm. 2. A robot must obey the orders given it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. 3. A robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. Later, when his stories included robots interacting with entire civilizations and not just individuals, Asimov added a fourth law, called the Zero Law, in that it came first in logical priority. It took precedence over his previous laws. Law Zero. A robot may not harm humanity or, by inaction, allow humanity to come into harm. Asimov's laws continue to exercise substantial influence in the robotic community, although even a cursory reading suggests that they are difficult or impossible to engineer into silicon circuitry. P.W. Singer addresses Asimov's laws in the context of drone warfare and other military technologies that by definition ignore law number one. Singer states that the absence of technology-specific ethical codes is troubling in the domain of combat. Can a robot be used as an instrument of torture, for instance? But unsurprising given how most industries regulate guns, drugs, automobiles, and other ethically complex technologies— they do so as lightly as possible. Rodney Brooks, for years the director of the MIT Robotics Initiative, says quite simply, quote, We do not know how to build robots that are perceptive enough and smart enough to obey these laws. Adding later, that it's possible Asimov did not realize just what a perceptual load these laws put on a robot. End quote. As recently as 2009, professors Robin Murphy of Texas A&M and David Woods of Ohio State put forth what they called the Three Laws of Responsible Robotics. The article was intended as a way to ask necessary questions about responsibility, intention, and unintended consequences, not in fictional stories, but real-world factories, nursing homes, and labs. Their laws follow... Note the primacy of human responsibility rather than compu-mechanical wisdom. Law number one, a human may not deploy a robot without the human-robot work system meeting the highest legal and professional standards of safety and ethics. Law two, a robot must respond to humans as appropriate for their roles. Law three, a human must be endowed with sufficient situated autonomy to protect his own existence as long as such protection provides smooth transfer of control, which does not conflict with the first or second laws. In short, one problem with the pervasiveness of science fiction is its emphasis on the robot rather than the human as the relevant moral actor. Gray Area after more than a half century of field trials of computer-enabled robots, we still lack a complete or nuanced understanding of what a robot is or is not. In the case of the automated guided vehicle, AG AGV, following a strip on the floor of a warehouse, there is sensing and locomotion, but it would appear that cognition can be absent or minimal. Notably, the first AGVs were not called robots, and even today, it is unclear how such devices are categorized. By contrast, the industrial robot, typically anchored in place, doing a repetitive task by electronic memory and operating inside a cage for human safety, can trace some of its U.S. origins directly to Asimov. Joseph Engelberger was explicitly motivated to build something much more than a new kind of machine tool. Quote, over and over, the advice was, don't call it a robot, call it a programmable manipulator. Call it a production terminal or a universal transfer device. The word is robot, and it should be robot. I was building a robot, damn it, and I wasn't going to have any fun, in Asimov's term, 
terms unless it was a robot. So I stuck to my guns, end quote. The sense-think-act paradigm proves to be problematic for industrial robots. Some observers contend that a robot needs to be able to move, otherwise the Watson computer might qualify. Another more recent example comes from Silicon Valley. The Nest is a learning thermostat. Powered by sensors and connected by Wi-Fi, it tracks a household's behaviors and modifies the temperature automatically. The team behind the Nest has more than its fair share of advanced degrees in computer science and robotics, and a clear record of genuine consumer product innovation. Many worked on the Apple iPod or Google search engine. The Nest senses movement, temperature, humidity, and light. The Nest reasons if there's no activity, nobody is home to need air conditioning. The Nest acts. Given the right sensor input, it automatically shuts the furnace down. Fulfilling as it does the three conditions, is the Nest therefore a robot? The fact that Google bought the startup at about the same time it made other robot investments suggests to some people that it is. Intuitive Surgical makes the Da Vinci Surgical System. Using sensitive joysticks, a surgeon makes the Da Vinci move probes and surgical tools inside a patient's body. The system certainly has sensors, and it acts on human patients. But without autonomous cognition, can the Da Vinci really be called a robot? Asimov did not define what a robot was, but posited a hypothetical moral system to which idealized robots should adhere. Dictionaries are of no help. Hollywood portrayals will be analyzed further, but for now, suffice it to say that neither the 1960s cartoon character Rosie Jetson nor Stanley Kubrick's Hal nor George Lucas's R2-D2 defines what a robot is or is not. Neither does any one of the hundreds of industrial robots at work in a typical auto factory. Yet all of us, or almost all of us, know a robot when we see one. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and visit my channel for more exciting content.